The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel uh, according to John. Glory to you. Uh, Jesus said to the Jews, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Then the Jews started arguing with one another, how can this man give us his flesh to eat, they said. Jesus replied, I tell you most solemnly, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. As I who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. This is the bread come down from heaven, not like the bread our ancestors ate. They are dead, but anyone who eats this bread will live forever. The, the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, so today we celebrate the feast of the, the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ. So this is a, a, a catechism, the homily today is a, a catechism on the Eucharist. In, in today's Gospel, we read from John chapter 6, and uh, over seven times in today's Gospel, Jesus uh, um, says, eat his flesh and drink his blood, that his flesh is food and, and drink. For example, in John chapter 6, verse 51, the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. For, for my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. And after this, many of his disciples uh, left him. They said, this is intolerable language. But the, in, in the Last Supper, um, from, we're just reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. You can imagine, imagine him holding a loaf of bread saying, This is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, because this is my blood. But when Jesus said, This is my body and this is my blood, we know that the apostles knew that he meant that literally because the early church fathers, some who were disciples of the apostles, held that belief very strongly. St. Ignatius of Antioch, for example, who was a disciple of St. John the Apostle, St. Ignatius wrote that the bread we eat and the wine we drink is the self-same body of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. The first time in history where it appears that there was some doubt about the belief in the real presence uh, was in the year, exactly in the year 700. It was in the town of Lanciano in Italy. A priest did believe in the real presence, but he did have doubts. He asked himself, could this really be true, that the, the mere bread and wine changes into my Lord? And after all, it is a huge claim to make. 
that the church makes. As the priest was offering mass, as this particular priest in Lanciano was offering mass, <coughs> <coughs> at the consecration when the priest repeats the words that Jesus prayed at the Last Supper the bread changed into human flesh so on this occasion the bread changed into human flesh the wine changed into human blood in 1972 so 12 uh, centuries uh, later 1972 uh, Pope St. John Pope uh, St. Pope St. Paul VI gave permission for scientists to touch, touch the host and examine the host. And all the scientists concluded that the flesh is the flesh of the main valve of a human heart and that the heart is still alive. Of course, it's impossible when you take a heart out of a body that the heart would continue to live. And, and, um, and this is, this is 1,200 years since the... Um, since the Mass at Lanciano. In 1992, the same miracle occurred in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Among the scientists who examined the host was a world expert in forensic medicine. A, a, he's a doctor that examines or um, determines the cause of a person's death. He discovered the host was the flesh of a main valve of a human heart. The heart was alive. And also the cause of death was extreme torture. When the host of Lanciano was compared to the host of Buenos Aires, Lanciano, the year 700, Buenos Aires, 1992, the finding was that they belonged to the heart of the same person. They had some people who have lived on Holy Communion, had no food, no water. Their only source of nourishment was Holy Communion, the Eucharist. Teresa Newman from Germany, who died in 1961, the last 42 years of her life, all she had was Holy Communion. So once a week, she was given Holy Communion. She never had any food or even any water. Marta Raban in France, who died in 1981, the last 50 years of her life. Louisa Piccarata in Italy, 19, died in 1947. And the, the longest to live on the Eucharist, 64 years. My personal devotion to the Blessed Sacrament began in my early 20s. At that age, I started attending Mass every day. In my prayer time, I would pray before the tabernacle. And when, I was left, when, when I left Jesus in the tabernacle, I always felt more, uh, more peace, more life. I received more grace praying before Jesus in the tabernacle than I did praying before a statue of Our Lady, for example. In my late 20s, when I felt the call to priesthood, I envisaged or imagined that I would, as a priest, I would have a lot of Eucharistic adoration in my parish. I wanted everyone to experience what I was experiencing. In 1992, I heard of uh, three men from Perth who had joined a religious order called the Missionaries of the Blessed Sacrament. And the order was based in the Philippines. From 1993 to 1997, I entered a seminary and stayed in a seminary in the Philippines. In 1997, Archbishop Hickey invited me to return to Perth, uh, my superior of the missionaries of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, agreed to, for me to return to Perth. Um, in the year 2000, I was ordained a, a diocesan priest uh, here in the, in the cathedral in Perth with the charism to promote perpetual Eucharistic adoration. So here in Perth, we have we actually have three parishes that have perpetual Eucharistic adoration. Another eight parishes have almost 24-7. I've also helped start um, perpetual adoration in a parish in Melbourne, one in Tasmania earlier this year, and five in New South Wales. I've been to Indonesia, Indonesia five times, and they now have 60 centres of perpetual Eucharistic adoration there, 60 well, why food? Why would the God who created the whole universe, who created us, would reduce himself to an inanimate object, namely food? Because Jesus is able to give himself to us, all he is, all he has, in the deepest possible union or communion, and hence the term holy communion. 
In, in today's gospel we read, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. So we, we become one with Christ as much as a human can become one with Christ. Now the ideal is our, our blessed mother, the Bible says she's full of grace or full of God. So Jesus is alive in her and that's what happens to us more and more as we receive our Lord in Holy Communion. Through the Eucharist, God will accomplish his ultimate plan, his final plan, uh, which is to restore his kingdom, heaven on earth, where we will be in communion with him, he in us and, and us in, in him. So therefore, God's plan is that we, that we receive him in Holy Communion as often as, as possible. If we can receive him uh, every day, then please do so. It's not too uh, inconvenient. And also, of course, we have perpetual Eucharistic adoration here. So ideally, come every day and, and visit him. He has much to achieve in you and in the world uh, today. If you can come every day, please, please try to do so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, please stand to profess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. My dear friends, we believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of our Saviour. United in this faith, let us ask God to provide for our needs, knowing that he has given us the bread of life. The Lord be with you. And with your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you. It was the time when the Feast of Dedication was being celebrated in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple walking up and down in the portico of Solomon. The Jews gathered round him and said, How much longer? Are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have told you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name are my witness. But you do not believe, because you are no sheep of mine. The sheep that belong to me listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I, I give them eternal life. They will never be lost, and no one will ever steal them from me. The Father who gave them to me is greater than anyone, and no one can steal from the Father. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Gospel, the Jews ask Jesus to make it clear whether or not he is the Messiah. And Jesus responds, the Father and I are one. However, there have been cases where the Jews have converted. Uh, in the 16th century, two young Jews in Valencia in Spain 
were praying for the Messiah to come soon. One of the young Jewish men told the following story. When I went one day to a certain place on the orders of my father to deal with some important business in the company of a friend the same age as me, we spoke about the Messiah whom we wanted to come soon. When night had already fallen, we observed a marvellous brightness in the sky. We fell on our knees with the utmost devotion, begging the Lord to manifest the Messiah and let us see him. In the middle of these prayers, we suddenly saw a shining chalice with the host above it. We felt an interior light penetrate our souls. We had the conviction that the Messiah was the host. Both young Jews later became Catholic. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew. Um, addressing the people and his disciples, Jesus said, The scribes and the Pharisees occupy the chair of Moses. You must therefore do what they tell you and listen to what they say, but, it, but do not be guided by what they do since they do not practice what they preach. They, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. But will they lift a finger to move them? Not they. Everything they do is done to attract attention, like wearing broader phylacteries and longer tassels, like wanting to take the place of honour at banquets and the front seats in the synagogues, being greeted obsequiously in the market squares and having people call them rabbi. You, however, must not allow yourselves to be called rabbi, since you have only one master and you are all brothers. You must call no one on earth your father, since you have only one father and he is in heaven. Nor must you allow yourselves to be called teachers, for you have only one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. Anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and anyone who humbles himself will be exalted. The, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. In the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why doesn't Jesus want people to call others rabbi, father, teacher? that the Pharisees use these titles only to exalt themselves. After saying this, Jesus adds, anyone who exalts himself will, will be humbled. So St. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, about Jesus, that though he was in the form of God, he took on the form of a slave. And although he is God, the creator of all things, he became human, and if that wasn't enough, he chose to become even humbler yet, even death on a cross. In today's gospel, Jesus added that the greatest among you must be your, your servant. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. To you. Um, on, on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said. And we don't know where 
they have put him. So Peter set out with the other disciple to go to the tomb. They ran together, but the other disciple, running faster than Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent down and saw the linen cloths lying on the ground, but did not go in. Simon Peter, who was following now, came up, went right into the tomb, saw the linen cloths on the ground, and also the cloth that had been over his head. And this was not with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and he believed. The, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we honour St. John the Apostle, who rested his head on our Lord's heart during the Last Supper. So St. Margaret Mary was also asked to rest her head on Jesus' heart. And she wrote, and it was December 27, 1673, while kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament, our Lord invited me to rest a long time on his divine heart and revealed to me the marvels of his love and the inexplicable secrets of his sacred heart. Jesus said to me, My divine heart is so full of love for mankind that it is no longer able to contain within itself the flames of its burning charity. And taking my heart, he showed it to me within his, within his own heart as a tiny atom being consumed by its burning furnace. Now, our Lord is always inviting us to rest our head on his sacred heart. Our Lord has an infinite desire to love us. As we rest on his sacred heart, we will be drawn into his heart as St. Margaret Mary experienced. Therefore, we should accept our Lord's invitation to rest our head on his heart and we should remain there always. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The, the disciples told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognized Jesus at the breaking of bread. They were still talking about this when, when Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. In a state of alarm and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. But he said, why are you so agitated? Why are these doubts rising in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. Yes, it is I indeed. Touch me and see for yourselves. A ghost has no flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Their joy was so great that they could not believe it, and they stood dumbfounded. So he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they offered him a piece of grilled fish, which he took and ate before their eyes. Then he told them, This is what I meant when I said, while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, has to be fulfilled. He then opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, So you see how it is written that the Christ would suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that in his name repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to this. The, the Gospel of the Lord. 
In today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, the first reading, St. Peter and John had just healed a man crippled from birth. St. Peter says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Immediately his feet and ankles were made strong, and he stood up, walking, leaping, and praising God. It was not the ideal time to live if you were a Christian. Christians were imprisoned, tortured, and some were killed, like St. Stephen. Saints Peter and John are then arrested and held on trial before the Sanhedrin. Then St. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to, to them, Be it known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man, who was crippled, is, is standing. So not even fear of imprisonment, torture or martyrdom would deter St. Peter and John from proclaiming their faith. At this time, despite the evil persecution, we read that many people converted to Christianity. So we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and the number of men came to about 5,000. The church flourishes where it is persecuted. Um, we 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 know the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Another example, Reverend Richard Wumbrun, an evangelical Lutheran minister. He spent 14 years in communist prisons in his homeland, Romania. Richard spent three years in solitary confinement while being tortured. Then he spent another five years in a crowded cell where torture continued after eight years, he was released, and promptly he resumed his preaching in the underground church. Two years later, he was caught, sentenced to 25 years of imprisonment. Richard, however, was released to Christians in Norway, who paid a ransom of $10,000 for his release in exile from Romania in 1964. The tortures to Christians in Romanian prisons, as Richard wrote, surpasses any possibility of human understanding. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. The following scene happened more times than I can remember, Richard wrote. A brother was preaching to the other prisoners when the guards suddenly burst in. They hauled him down the corridor to their beating room. And what seemed an endless beating, they brought him back. Slowly he picked up his battered body, painfully straightened his clothing, and resumed his preaching. Now, brethren, where did I leave off before I was interrupted? Only to be arrested again or, or to be beaten again. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 32, 33, Jesus said, Everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father in heaven. Persecution was the order of the day after the communist takeover of China in 1949. And 69 years later, 69, um, maybe yes, 73 years later, remains so today. Mok Tuan Wei Yi, you are sentenced to life imprisonment, decreed the chief judge of China. The crime, stating her allegiance to the universal Roman Catholic Church and belonging to the Legion of Mary. One of her brothers had already been tortured to death and another brother, Paul, a surgeon and a father of eight children, had been jailed and given a 15-year sentence. His crimes were for being a staunch Catholic, helping priests, and talking about Our Lady. Ten years before his release, after 15 years, the Chinese authorities tortured him to death. When Paul's son proclaimed his, father's, his dead father's innocence, they sent him to prison in Siberia for 20 years. As for the current Roman Catholic Church in China, things are now worse than ever. With all Catholics being forced to join the government's puppet, 
patriotic church or, or property formerly owned by the Roman Catholic Church in China uh, has been confiscated. It, it is currently a crime for a Roman Catholic priest to offer mass, administer the sacraments, teach catechism and refuse to join the patriotic church. The true Catholic Church in China, despite repression, has gone from 3 million members prior to 1949 to 8 to 10 million members today. Back to Romania. A Christian was sentenced to death in Romania. Before being executed, he was allowed to see his wife. He had been sentenced to death. His last words to his wife were, you must know that I die loving those who kill me. They don't know what they do. My last request from you is to love them too. Don't have bitterness in your heart because they killed your beloved one. We will meet in heaven. These words impressed the officer of the secret police who attended the discussion between the two. Afterwards, he told Reverend Richard Wombrandt that story in prison where he had been for becoming a Christian himself. Most of the Christians in the prisons of Romania, China and other countries are the happy, happiest of all the prisoners there, even though they are tortured more than the other prisoners. And this is, of course, because God cannot be outdone in generosity. If we are generous to God by preaching his name, when threatened with torture and imprisonment, then God will be much more generous with us. Increasingly, Christians are being sidelined or persecuted. Uh, Cardinal Pell, who was the third highest ranking person in the Catholic Church in, in Australia, and well, no, third and high ranking person in the Catholic Church universally, he was persecuted and imprisoned for over a year for crimes that were blatantly uh, ludicrous. The West Australian Government, March 27, so only a few weeks ago, two days after the International Day of the Unborn, uh, made it law, 2024, made it law that any mother can have an abortion for any reason and at any stage in their pregnancy. If the baby is born alive, the law is that the baby must be left to die without food or clothing. The child usually dies within 20 hours. The, the world is increasingly becoming hostile to Christianity. It is a real possibility that many of us here in this church today will in the not so distant future face persecution, even imprisonment or torture for being, for being a, a Christian. Our Lord said, remember what I told you. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Our challenge is to be firm or convicted in our Christian faith. If we are lukewarm or if we are doubtful about what the church teaches, we may not be able to be used as Christ calls us at this time. The Prince of Darkness appears to be making headway. However, God is victorious because where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. On Easter Sunday, God blew away everyone's minds by rising himself from the dead. Today, he will blow away everyone's minds by rising us, his creatures, from the dead. God will rise us from being merely of the flesh or of the world to being of the Spirit, like our Blessed Mother, who is full of grace, full of the Holy Spirit, more of heaven than of earth. God's plans exceed all our expectations because there is no limit to, to infinite love. I don't like to imagine our Lord's love as, as like a, an ocean, but even that is not, an, his love is even greater than that. If you imagine the Pacific Ocean being poured on you, which he, he, he that's that, that would be a description, could be a description of his love, although it's still not enough. His love is even greater than, than that. Even though he loves us that way at every every moment. 
I'll just remind everyone about spiritual communion. Uh, spiritual communion is receiving our Lord. It, it is Holy Communion as much as sacramental communion is. So at Mass we receive the sacrament, sacramental communion, but we can receive the communion any time, Holy Communion, any time we want. In fact, we are encouraged to, to, to receive uh, Holy Communion as often as possible, spiritual communion. St. Francis de Sales and Maximilian Colby made a spiritual communion every 15 minutes. No matter how many spiritual communions we make, our Lord would want us to make more. How do we make a spiritual communion? There are, there are many set prayers. For example, Lord, since I cannot receive you sacramentally, please may I receive you spiritually. I have a practice of making many spiritual communions each day. When I rise, whenever I start to pray, when I make a phone call, when I'm about to drive somewhere, when I enter a church, I also ask for spiritual communion, not, not only for myself, but for everyone. I pray, since we cannot receive you sacramentally, please may we receive you spiritually. In other words, when I pray a spiritual communion, I pray that everyone will receive holy communion. The actual words I use are, Lord, since we cannot receive you sacramentally, please may we receive you spiritually. May your life be fully present in us and may our life be hidden in you. May you be glorified in everyone. Amen. The more we ask for a spiritual communion, especially when we ask for it for everyone, the more God's love will come to perfection uh, in this, this world. As, as we read in today's second reading from the first letter of St John. I have printed cards with that spiritual communion prayer on it. At, at, at the entrances of the church. So, um, so uh, please take, take a, a card or, or more cards um, home. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand to profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and life everlasting. Amen. My dear friends, Christ has given us this promise. Anything you ask from the Father in my name, he will grant it. Let us now ask our Father for all our needs in the name of our risen Saviour. Help all Christians to bear witness that Christ is risen by showing that he lives in them. Lord, hear us. Grant that workers may take pride in what they do and unite themselves with Christ, who works through them to recreate the world. Lord, hear us. Give to sinners the gift of repentance, that Christ be, may set them free to live and work for man's redemption. Lord, hear us. When we break bread together in the Eucharist celebration, open our eyes to recognize the risen Lord and give us the grace to recognize one another. Lord, hear us. We now pray in, in silence for our, our own intentions. Uh, 
Lord, hear us. Lord God, hear the prayers we offer in these days of resurrection. Make our joy complete through Christ our Lord.
And uh, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, our Lord. And Jesus said to his disciples, Alas for you, Chorazin, alas for you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And still it will not go as hard with Tyre and Sidon at the judgment as with you. As for you, Capernaum, did you want to be exalted high as heaven? You shall be thrown down to hell. Anyone who listens to you listens to me. Anyone who rejects you rejects me. And those who reject me reject the one who sent me. The, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alas, for Jesus' words, alas for you, Chorazin, alas for you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. As for you, Capernaum, you shall be thrown into hell. Uh, these are the towns where Christ did most of his ministry, where he did most of his miracles, especially Capernaum. Yet the people in these towns uh, re rejected him. Hence, our Lord uses the strongest words possible. As for you, Capernaum, you shall be thrown into hell. Our city, Perth, of course, would be one of those cities. Perth is a city that condones lifestyles and makes laws which sanctions sin. However, God is also very present, very active here. For example, we have three chapels of perpetual Eucharistic adoration and another eight parishes which almost have all, all the hours covered. Um, yes, so let, let us today be conscious of, of our city, Perth, and to take this city to, to prayer. God is very present, very active here. Um, that, that our hearts may respond as much as he is, he is giving. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Yes, yes. Jesus said to his disciples, Watch yourselves, or your hearts will be coarsened with debauchery and drunkenness and the cares of life. And that day will be sprung on you suddenly, like, like a trap. For it will come down on every living man on the face of the earth. Stay awake praying at all times for the strength to survive all that is going to happen and to stand with confidence before the Son of Man. The, the Gospel of the Lord. Yes. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is still talking about the last days before his second coming. He warns us that in those days we'll need to watch ourselves if we don't our hearts will be coarsened. In the first reading, Daniel is given a vision of a beast with ten horns. In the book of Revelation, St. John the Apostle is given a vision of a beast with ten horns and seven heads. In both visions, the beast is allotted three and a half years of power over mankind. In Revelation 13.8, we read, all the, inha all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, everyone whose name is not written in the book of life. Today's gospel, Jesus adds, stay awake, pray at all times for the strength to survive all that is going to happen. Yeah. Um, tomorrow begins Advent. Um, if, we're, if we're not already praying an hour a day, and if it's... Um, uh, yeah, convenient or possible to do so, 
then that could be a commitment for Advent to spend one, one hour in prayer a day, um, preferably before the Blessed Sacrament during Advent. And if, they, if we're not on the perpetual adoration roster, then to, uh, then to do, do so, okay, just, just for Advent. Okay. God is answering our prayers with infinite love. Um, and, and, it's, and it's through prayer that, prayers that will have the strength to survive all that is going to happen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. And Jesus went out to the shore of the lake, and all the people came to him, and he taught them. As he was walking on, he saw Levi, the son of Altheus, sitting by the customs house, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. When Jesus was at dinner in his house, a number of tax collectors and sinners were also sitting at the table with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them among his followers. When the scribes of the Pharisee party saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, It is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I did not come to call the virtuous, but sinners. The, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Okay. So the, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Pharisees complain that our Lord is associating with tax collectors and sinners. And our Lord replies, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I did not come to call the virtuous, but sinners. The Pharisees felt they were justified to be angry with Jesus because he seemed to be condoning the actions of tax collectors and sinners. He seemed to be condoning a sin. The Pharisees were also angry towards the tax collectors and sinners because their actions were displeasing to God. There might be people that we are angry with because their actions are displeasing to God. It could be someone in our family, among our friends, it could even be someone in authority. God is love, therefore he loves sinners. No matter how great the sinner is, no matter how great, God loves him or her un unconditionally. God pleads for that sinner to repent. Uh, there's, there's no um, lack of love or grace that God gives, or, or no lack of pleading uh, for the, that God gives to, to the sinner in order for that sinner to repent. And if that sinner were to say sorry, regardless of how great that sinner is, then God would forgive him. He would, he would not lose his soul. He would not go to hell. As, as Jesus says, for the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save, save the world. Um, and, and we are called to have the same heart as, as our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.